Hey, hey, Energizer, welcome to another episode of the Jones and Four show. And this, this is going to be a freaking awesome episode for you. So strap in, get ready, buckle up, whatever you need to do, because, oh my goodness, we have an amazing guest here today talking with us, sharing her expertise, her wisdom about storytelling. Well, not just storytelling of the stories we tell to other people, but the stories we tell to ourselves. Because, uh, you know, think about this. You are talking to yourself all day long. Like, let's be honest here. We all talk to ourselves. We all do. I remember as a kid thinking that, oh, am I a freak because I always talk to myself out loud or silently? The answer is no, we all do it, right? So admit it, we talk to ourselves and you are with yourself 100% of the time. That means the stories you are telling to yourself, you hear 100% of the time. And that makes a huge difference in your life. And to help you live your life to the max, to help you get the most out of life, we got to make sure the stories we are telling ourselves are honest, whole, truthful, but also lifting, positive, uplifting stories to encourage us. And we're going to get into all of that. And she might even disagree with me. And that's a beautiful thing. But let's see what she says. So please welcome our awesome guest, uh, Marcy Pusey, to join us and uh, being here. Thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us. Thanks for having me. That was, I was just kind of like, well, show's over. You said it. It was great. <laughs> it's exactly. And Don, thank you for joining us. Have a good day, folks. <laughs> yeah, that was so well said. Thanks for having me here. Oh my gosh. It is my honor to have you here uh, because the storytelling component of our life, right? The is, is so important. The narratives yeah. we tell ourselves are huge. And I didn't realize it for years and years and years of my life, almost 30 years. I didn't realize that I was self-sabotaging myself sabotaging myself is probably the best way to say it right? <laughs> by the stories this is a real raw authentic show i make mistakes folks you're used to this um marcy welcome to the show we make <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so like i'm sabotaging myself based on these stories i'm telling uh myself mm -hmm. and all that my gosh how many my times can i say myself but this happens so for, before we get into that that's what we're going to discuss let's know you get to know you more share a little about your history your story how you got into this whole storytelling uh, message and meaning yeah, yeah. so uh, the origins are sort of that first i i always have journaled or written mm. just as a way of kind of understanding my own world wow. flannery o'connor has a great quote that I consistently butcher, but something to the effect of, I write so that when I read what I've written, I understand what I'm thinking. And the first time I saw that quote, you got it? Wait, should I let it sit? <laughs> say, I think I got it, but I say it one write. more time, just in case. I write so that when I read what I've written, I understand what I'm thinking. That makes sense. Sorry for the hold up. No, 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 it's good. I want to make sure it sits. It gets embedded um and i again it's slightly different than that but it's that vein mm -hmm. and the idea of that resonated with me so deeply because that's exactly my journaling experience i'm just sort of pouring out but then i always go back and reread what i've written and then i'm like oh that's what's going on that's what i'm thinking or feeling and then i continue to write now with some of that awareness you know, funneling in and whatever it might be. So that was just a default, a natural way that I learned how to exist before I understood any brain dynamics around it or healing dynamics or any of that. It just was how I existed and got through life. Um, but getting through life, as you know, has a lot of really hard elements. And all of us now have experienced at least one major traumatic event when we look at the pandemic. But now that's just the least, right? Like that's one of many, many different forms of traumatic events we've experienced. So as I navigated some of my own, which included, um, I was raised in a single parent home on welfare for a little bit, not the same kind of traumatic event you might think of, but I picked up some messages quite young that the least amount of a burden I could be, the more value and worth I had. Like the least I was a cost of any kind to my struggling financially family, then the more worth I had, the least emotionally that I put any burden on people, the more value I had. So that as a child became a kind of trauma in the way that my brain perceived the experience. And then as I grew up, um, I got into social services and therapy, and I learned a ton about just the needs of people and um, my own needs. <laughs> we say a lot of therapists get into therapy, you know, to figure themselves out and understand what's going on in our own heads. Um, 
but that also led me to foster children and adopt children. And that is a whole other experience with trauma, both secondarily through their stories and their experiences, but primarily as I experienced the consequences of their trauma, like it, be, it, it re-traumatized people around them. So that, and then I ended up leaving um, an abusive marriage as a person of faith. Like it's already hard to leave a marriage, but when you add on to it, uh, faith culture, right. not actually what I believe God's word said or who God is, but the culture that can sometimes come around it. There's all these other messages that are constantly taught to us that are just purely cultural. And so having to leave an abusive situation within that context. So those are just some of the, the big ones I'll highlight, but what they did is they opened my eyes to pain that exists in what I call clubs sometimes. Like I didn't know about the, the traumatized adoptive parent club until I was a member. I didn't know about the abused wife Christian club until I was part of it. And it made me realize like there's whole groups of people struggling like I was or like I had. And what could I do to help their experience go a little better than mine did? Or if something was really helpful in one of my experiences, like how can I give that? So they have that as a support too. So to sum that up, primarily there was a default in me around writing and, and just understanding my own story as I told it on paper. But then as I went through life, experiencing things going like, oh my gosh, I cannot be the only one in this situation. Or I cannot be the only one where this is so hard. Like who can I help? Who can I come alongside um, in the way that I needed or need and provide that kind of support along the way? So that's some of my origin story and what led me to deep diving into the brain and how, uh, how it is so impacted and, and uniquely responsive to story, how we can use it to heal our own selves, to rewrite elements of the messages that we've told ourselves, and then how to offer that to the world. When we put our stories outside of our head, out into the world, we now get to impact others on similar journeys and we get to touch and light up their brains. It's crazy. But all of that deep dive came from me just going like, this is hard. Does anyone else think so? Why is this so hard? You know, and like just deep diving into understanding what's going on. And now I'm pretty good at understanding what's going on. Okay. Long answer, but that's, that's kind of what brings me to today. I love it. No, that was a beautiful answer. No matter the length, it was, it was <laughs> absolutely perfect. Um, I, I love that you took your struggles, the hardships you've had and learned from them, grown from them and said, hey, there's other people who, out here who are struggling with this. Like I struggled, let me help them. So let me reach my arm back and take what I've learned and grown here and share that with them. That's one of the big things about sharing our light with the world is we yes. all go through different aspects of, you know, hardships in our life. Let's learn from them and let's reach back. Right. So that saying of, you know, I, I came through hell. Now let me help you through it because let me reach my arm back because I have tools and strategies. I can't do the journey for you, but I can point out what steps to take or things, suggestions to help. And so I love, love, love that you did that and the different avenues and different areas of your life that, that you struggled or realized, oh my gosh, there's all these different clubs, right? And, and then within those clubs, realizing, oh, I never knew this existed, yeah. to expanding your awareness going, oh my gosh, there's probably clubs I have never even yes. thought of yes. uh, still that exist. And not that I'm able to totally help them because I haven't been in those shoes, but I recognize I'm aware that there are people struggling in a way that I don't even understand. Yeah. And that's huge. 100%. Can I go back to something you mentioned early on in that story that stuck out to me because yeah. uh, this is totally opposite than, than me, and that's journaling. Yeah. Um, now, for me personally, I did not start journaling till I, I was much older, right? Till I was an adult. I tried to journal or, you know, as a kid, as a young boy, I'm like, I don't have a diary. I'm going to write a journal, right? And so I tried journaling and doing that because apparently words matter to, to little old Spencer. And um, so I tried and I could never keep it up, never keep up. And I know many of our energizers have said this, a similar story that they've always struggled to keep a journal, right? Or a diary. And I love the fact that of, of that saying, right? I write it down, I can reread it, and then I can see what I'm thinking to really even simplify it even more yet for my, my brain to just wrap my head around it, to go, okay, that makes sense. Um, like for me, I noticed when I started journaling, um, it helps me see the story I'm telling myself, to see the narrative, to see the, the, the pro thought process of how things are going around. It allows me to step out and back to see it all. But you've been doing this since you were a kid. Is it a detriment? Are, am I 
not be doing as well or our energizers who d- have not done it since they were a kid, are they not doing as well because they haven't been doing it for years and years? Such a great question. It was a very long way to get there, but we got there. No, it's so good. I, we, we talked about personality wiring before we started and I'm a hundred percent like, I know why this is happening and I love it. Um, it's so good. No, I, no, no. The point is, can we pause to talk a little about the brain? Yeah. When we experience a traumatic event, a few different things happen. Um, immediately in the moment, part of your brain is trying to decide what is danger and, and what is the threat and what is the threat against? And then what needs to happen, right? And I actually, I have two TEDx talks. The second one is you are more than your traumatic experiences or something like that. And I talk about these animals that I use to reference the brain. So I, I talk about an owl being your prefrontal cortex, which is where like all of your rational, logical thinking happens, cause and effect, delayed gratification, like the good executive functions happen there. And then I talk about the meerkat as your amygdala, which is the part of your brain on alert, looking for danger, always scanning. This is like your survival 101. And then there's a tiger in your brainstem who's often there just chilling, like hanging out. But if the meerkat says danger, that tiger is either going to fight the danger or run from the danger. And your owl's going to fly away. I, I use this language all the time in my own life with my kids, with my friends, because it's so helpful to recognize in those moments, like I don't have my owl with me right now. Like I probably shouldn't make any major life decisions because my meerkat, I can feel when it's on alert, you know, you can feel it in your body with certain cues, you know, you're, you're maybe feel flushed or your heart rate has picked up or you get the big wide eyes. Sometimes you can feel how big your eyes are if there's been a startle, right? Okay. So traditional therapy tends to talk to the owl, which is not where traumatic events get stored. When your brain has perceived something to actually be trauma and your tiger could not fight it successfully or run from it successfully, it becomes a freeze and it gets stuck there with the tiger. Now the tiger is your automatic functions, breathing, eating, sleeping, like everything you do without thinking about it. And it's very present, always in the present very sensory, very in the present. Okay. So that's where the unprocessed trauma hangs out. But when you go to talk therapy, you're only dealing with the owl who wasn't even there. The owl went to the Bahamas while the tiger was figuring out what to do. Right. This is why so often people trying to work through life injuries, stay in therapy forever and don't feel that different because we're, we're really addressing the wrong part of the brain. I'm getting to the answer of your question. Are you a detriment to not be writing? This is the segment. So that being said, if we do want to treat or address or dislodge that trauma that is unprocessed, stuck with the tiger, we have to do sensory things not the talking, the sensory things. And sensory things are anything that you can do with your body to express yourself. So an uncensored writing is an example of that. Uncensored speaking, um, to your point, I know people who will record themselves and either have it auto transcribe and they can read it or have it, or just listen to it back again. So you can hear it. So there's still ways of working within your own wiring and what feels supportive and good to you. It could be free movement with your body. It could be songwriting or just sitting at with an instrument and letting come out what comes out. It can be fine art. So there's an element where, okay, it's easy with words you've written to read them and understand them more immediately than like, I just danced around the room (laughs) and now I'm weeping and I don't know why. Like you might have a different level of understanding, but you're doing the really good work as far as like addressing what's been stuck there and allowing your brain and body to move it somewhere versus like still feeling helpless about it. So no, it's okay. If you're not a writer, be mindful. And you talk about this a lot of yourself, your unique wiring, your strengths, what your superpower is and how your light shines and work within that, figure out what it is for you that gives you that same sense of of self-understanding. For me, that's putting words on a page. It sounds like for you that can happen, but it's not the consistent thing. I imagine for you, there's a level of verbal processing or I don't know, are you musical? So that's, that's an interesting thing um, (laughs) that that you mentioned all this. So, I mean, it took me a long time to get into it and now it's, it's become a habit of journaling and I I love it. And it's been so eye-opening and raised my awareness in many ways now that I do it uh, every day but I'm very musical, right? Uh, I'm a classically trained piano player. And so as a kid, that's what I did. I sat down and I played at the piano without any issues or qualms or anything like that, just sat and played. 
that's, I had a sense. I was like, something feels musical about you. Um, and that is such a way of expression. So I love that our natural design already is so supportive of us. Like our brain is always trying to heal. But if we talk about the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves will actually disrupt the natural desire of our brain to heal. If we could, if we could be aware of how those stories are disrupting it, we could just be on a trajectory of healing. You as a kid didn't have so many messages yet. You just knew it felt good to sit and play and you did. And every time you did that, you were touching things that might have gotten a little stagnant or stale in that part of your brain and helping your brain to figure out where to put it. And you don't even have to have a therapist sitting with you to explain that to you. You don't have to understand what's being moved, but you probably had some level of emotional experience after like, gosh, I feel better. I feel good. I feel light. Or sometimes we're dealing with emotions we didn't realize were there and you just feel other things unusual. You're like, oh, why do I feel so heavy right now or emotional right now? And that's where you get to ask yourself good questions. You know, why do I? Um, what, what, is, what is this experience trying to tell of me? You know, if for someone else, it's like, I just need to move my body all around the room, close my door, you know, and then ask yourself at the end, like, is there something that that experience or dance is trying to tell me or show me, or what did I hear in it? So there's other ways of still gaining some understanding um, by doing the thing that's so sensory for you to address, yeah, whatever's going on in your head. I think that's, wow, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's absolutely huge. Uh, Cause I think of clients and people I've worked with who and other energizers who have different things, right? They draw, right? They dance, they move their body, different things to just express themselves. And, and in that expressing themselves, sometimes all of a sudden feelings come up that they didn't know, right? All of a sudden they're crying randomly or they're really joyful or they, they notice these other feelings come up and sometimes they can pinpoint where it comes from. But a lot of the time it's just letting it flow because you're finally letting that emotion come through that, that, uh, issue that trauma, whatever it is, start to flow through you through whatever is most comfortable to you, whether that's journaling, whether that's playing musical instrument, dancing, whatever. Um, I remember seeing this in my students. So I, I was a middle school, high school choir director for nine years. And um, I saw that with my students, right? That the students all of a sudden, I mean, it could be the, the music we were singing, um, you know, the text all of a sudden struck home, struck a chord, and they were, they were down and out for a couple minutes or whatever, just because they were processing and to see them go through it, but also that they were able then to express themselves through that music and get a lot of feelings where they felt safe. They felt like it was home and, and all that just because they could express themselves through different ways. Um, and I think that's huge. We're all unique. We are all amazing. We all have our own talents and things that love and move us. Let's tap into those to express yeah. ourselves yeah. with that. So that's, that's huge. Yeah. So a question for you, right? You said, uh, <laughs> Going back to the original long answer, that wasn't long, it was beautiful, but I'm, I'm going back to that thinking, okay, so these stories you said, they, they help us and they could help change the world, right? Help, help our impact with the world. How do these stories help us? Let's, let's break it down to basics first. The yeah. stories we're telling, so let's say, okay, let's make it personal just because yeah. I can. Do it. Because um, it's my show, gosh darn it. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> All right, but, but I know Energizers, you will relate to this. So mm -hmm. for many, many years, even to this year to a degree, I told myself I am bad at math. It's a story uh -huh. I've been telling myself. I'm bad at math because I always seem to struggle with it. Yeah. And lo and behold, um, it was because, or um, because I always thought I, I struggled with it, right? I, but when I look back, I was homeschooled. So when I look back on my scores when I was actually in public school and private school, um, I actually was really good at math. But then I told myself the story afterwards and I'm bad at math, bad at math, bad at math. So now I believe I'm bad at math, right? I need a calculator all the time for anything, basic math, right? Just because I don't trust myself. So talk to us. Why do, why do I have this story? I mean, name it kind of science or why. Um, I can give you some ideas. But in any case, <laughs> what does that do to me? And how can we change the story around? Yeah. I'm like living that with my daughter right now who's homeschooled and thinks she's bad at math. <laughs> and then as soon as she gets a good lesson, a good teacher and a good lesson, and she's primed for it, she walks away going like, I'm a genius. I know more math than all you. Like the story changes just depending on the experience. That was that was yeah, right. heartbeat, yeah. <laughs> like I was good at trig. I got trig. Anything else? Nah, I don't know. But, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the thing about the stories that we tell ourselves is that one, 
if we're not even aware that we tell ourselves stories, they're just constantly playing. We never catch them. We're just living by default right. in life all the time, believing everything like a sponge that's just soaking up all of the external feedback and making it true. Um, so that's the first thing, right? The second thing is when you can bring some awareness to it and you slow it down and you challenge it, it's so eye-opening the mm -hmm. impact and power that it's had on you. And to a degree disappointing, like at my place in life, I'm this year. So I just turned 41 and this is the first time in my life that I actually have an embedded belief that I hold value and worth outside of what anyone can give me. It goes back to that original story that my parents never intended to tell me, but that I picked up that if I am the least amount of burden possible, if I can keep you the happiest in your life, the smoothest flowing, then I have some worth and value. And then that, ex that got exploited in marriage. Like that's the, that storytelling took me into a relationship where I thought, wow, this is where I'll get some worth and value. Someone sees something in me enough to marry me, but then that got exploited and I could never keep the person happy or, uh, you know, so I was constantly like working so hard for my value. So there's an element there too, of disappointment. Like, man, I wish I could have lived my whole life knowing I had worth and value, like not just cognitive but embedded because then I would have made such better decisions <laughs> the right. whole time but then I'm also so grateful that now I do see because how many people end up on their deathbed and never knew never knew and that makes me want to cry like I just I feel for those people and so okay I love what you're doing because you're bringing awareness to that right now the the stories that we tell ourselves are basically your survival brain trying to understand what's going on to make meaning of everything so that the next time you're in the situation it knows how to keep you safe mm -hmm. the thing is like maybe maybe when you were a kid believing you sucked at math like served you in some way and then as you got older it didn't anymore but it was kind of like you were walking through life with a limp right. and like you know your body had originally compensated for an actual injury. I don't, I mean, I don't know what that would be around math, but if there was like an actual injury, right. your brain decided to compensate, like, nope, if you just believe you're bad at math, then you're excused from this. And you don't have to be disappointed with yourself about that. And you don't have to compare yourself to the kids who are good at it, right? Like there's an element of value and worth survival that could have been part of it. But then as life went on, like the injury healed, but you're still walking with a limp. So when we continue to repeat those stories to ourselves, we actually continue to reinforce it in our whole body, right. our brains, even though we can think about the future and we can think about the past and remember it, our body is never actually there with us. It's always here with us. So anything that you are allowing to fill your head, your mind, your heart, your body is experiencing right now in this moment and integrating as true to support you in continuing to survive. So with math, maybe not as big of a deal per se, although there's still some good self-talk there to understand like, where does that come from? But around areas of, of identity or worth or the comparison we do with our bodies to other people's bodies or our fear of the future or finances or loved ones, whatever it might be, when we allow ourselves to regret, fear the future, if I'm being afraid that one day I'm gonna have to take a math test and I suck at math and I have all this stress, I'm feeling it now. Right. As if I'm in the future, but it's a story. It's a, there's, we don't know the future. It's a story being told. So I think that's one of the biggest things that is impactful about the stories that we tell is that when we let our minds wander and create up narratives to fill in gaps, our body only knows how to experience that as true. All right. Your brain and doesn't it, know if it's, it's a thought or if it's reality. Exactly. Exactly. So then now we're walking through life with all these limps but the injuries have, you know, technically given healed. We're not in the same space of danger that originally caused us to pick up that message. And yet it's continued to serve us in some ways, but also really, really hold us and disrupt us in other ways. So let me ask you this, that, yeah. that, that's awesome. Um, one of my other things that I've struggled overcoming for years, and it wasn't until a handful of years ago that I realized I even had this, is that need to prove. And I know energizers, if you listen to this anytime, you've heard me say this before, because it's a story I reference often, but I always felt like I needed to prove myself. 
always, whether it was music, with teaching, with life, money, whatever. Right? I always felt I needed to prove my worth, that I had that worth to a degree. And I needed to, once I realized that, I started to change that story. But so my question is, how do we change that story? Once we realize, oh, this is just a narrative I'm telling myself, oh, I'm bad at math, oh, I need to prove myself. How do we change that narrative around? Yeah. I'd love to hear how you did it. I mean, I'll give a little answer, but then I'd love to just kind of poke at you and what your experience was. I think one is being intentional to slow down and begin to recognize either patterns or beliefs or cues, like whatever we are able to recognize first, grab it and ask really curious questions about it. You know, I began to notice that in some of my friendships, I just kind of had this anxious, panicky energy. If I didn't get a response to a text right away, or if they kind of looked at me a little funny again, cause I was so oriented towards like, I need you to be happy. So I feel like I have worth and value. So I was hyper tuned over associated to how other people were doing. And I began to just feel it instead of reacting. Like, you know, in the past, I might've just said, text again, are things okay? What do you need? What did I do wrong? Do I, do I need to ask forgiveness or something? Like what happened? Nice. Um, instead of like just acting, stopping and going, that's a weird feeling and I don't like it. And I don't want to make decisions because of it. Like, what is that? And, and now I have, now I do that all the time. Like that feeling will still come up sometimes, mm -hmm. but now I recognize it as like, oh, that's not actually energy I need to direct towards the situation or the person. This is energy I need to turn inward and like revisit where my worth lies and that someone else can't give it to me. So from the first point, like just being able to hear your own thoughts and messages enough to start paying attention. And it takes time because you've been living by default like a sponge for so long. So to be able to slow down, even if it's one thought, one message, one feeling that's consistently coming out that you can grab hold of, that. The other thing that I did that was so powerful for me was I invested in a purpose and clarity coach. I mentioned him before our talk, who... Um, whose goal is to help people understand their natural strengths and wirings and then to live from that place. Because when we do that, we get to show up our healthiest, best selves, and we get to influence everyone around us to do the same. And so I actually then invested in someone who had been trained or had experience sitting with me and helping me understand how I've been wired. And it helped me to recognize, oh, I do have something to offer the world oh, these weaknesses that I've been so ashamed about, like they're just, they're just not even part of my wiring. And now I know that other people have that. And we're kind of like this big body, this big puzzle that when we come together, we create this really beautiful picture, but I wanted to be all the pieces. I thought I was supposed to be all the pieces. <laughs> like I am the puzzle, but I was constantly failing at being the whole puzzle. And so um, I, th I think that was such a big part was having someone who could also hear me and catch my thoughts, like in the coaching conversations, like, oh, Let's, let's talk about that, you know, and help me begin to recognize things that were, that were just kind of common every day. He uses this metaphor of like, sometimes we ask a fish in water to describe the water. Mm -hmm. That's so hard. You need, you can't, I can't, no, I can't. <laughs> in fact, I have a really, in my wiring is a really high sense of values and um, integrity and ethics. And, and you too, this is also in the top of your wiring. So we were always funneling everything through this, but someone asked me the other day to give them a definition of value and then share my top value with them. And I was like, man, I know this is one of my strengths in my wiring and I cannot put words to any of it. And so the same coach was like, yeah, because you're a fish in water and they just asked you to describe water. <laughs> like, we can describe things we struggle at much better. Right. 100%. And usually those are things we see because they're not part of our natural wiring and strength. So all that to say, again, bringing it back, finding a way, just being willing to be intentional, to slow your thinking down, um, to begin to pay attention to any cues that show up for you that are uncomfortable. And, and then I, I absolutely think investing in somebody who's trained in that way to help you listen. I don't think everyone needs therapy. Like, I think you could start with someone like my friend, Gary, he's at Better Future International. You can start with someone there. And then that like, frees up the actual mental health stuff for therapy. <laughs> There's a, lot, a lot of people are going to therapy for identity work, but we can do that with a really good coach. And I know you've talked about even um, creating some programs coming up that are, that are focused around helping people begin to slow the process and bring some awareness so that we can function healthier and more helpful. So 
That being said, for you, <laughs> when you, like, what was that shift for you like? Because that was such a default for so long. Do you remember early on, like, what was the pain or the discomfort that kind of like brought your awareness to it? So I do remember. Um, it was, it's still very clear. Um, before I get to that story, and I'll tie this in, it's, okay. um, for me, I believe that awareness is the key to everything. If you want to change or do anything, you need to be aware of it. And so it's just the fact that you were aware of your thoughts. So first of all, be aware of like, okay, I, I don't value myself. Or I don't believe I have self-value, self-worth, right? Necessarily, unless I'm making someone else's life easy. Yeah. That then, okay, now I know this. So I'm aware of this. Now I need to be aware of how does this play out through my day? So you're aware and asking yourself those questions. Is this part of this? Is this... Is, yeah. is this part of my day? Even if it's that one thing a day, right? Uh, and then it builds up to two things or three things. And then yeah. you, you start to expand on it. And because it, it, can, it can be extremely overwhelming, uh, yeah. but you take it a little bit of time, keep working. Okay. So for me, what happened was I'll give you a really quick abbreviate, uh, abbreviated story. So um, I let my ego run wild, um, run my life and build me up, build me up, build me up. But I also built a ton of walls with this ego, right? To shelter, to protect little old me until choices I made, um, made uh, that ego kept building up till it came crashing down, right? A bulldozer hit, hit it. It didn't, I didn't dismantle the walls. They came, there was like TNT exploded and there was nothing left but little old Spencer. And in any case, um, it was a really rough time in my life, suicidal, all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, I then went to see a therapist for the first time. Yeah. And seeing a therapist to, to work through the psychotherapist uh, um, on friend's recommendation, uh, went to see him and we started talking, working through all the crap, right? And um, realizing then as we were discussing and kind of going back, of like, why why am I doing this, right? He, he started seeing the, the key points that I couldn't see because he's taking the outside view and going, yeah, uh, it seems like you need to prove yourself a lot. I'm like, oh my God, totally. And then I could see, he didn't say it quite like that, but it was, it, it was a self-discovery on my part. I'm just you know, uh, saying it like that. But in any case, uh, we kept going and then for me to realize, oh, now I know where this came from and, and how it developed and all the, the ways that strengthened that belief over the years, right? As you said, that sponge yeah. absorbing, 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 thinking I need to prove myself. I need to prove myself. And it was not filling this void that I felt inside because that's what I was trying to do. I tried to fill this void that I protect up with armor that wasn't doing it. So then long story short, um, he suggested because I, well, actually I suggested, can we find an affirmation for this? Cause I was, that have mm -hmm. been doing affirmations for a couple of months. Um, and you know, I, I was working on positivity at that point and building that into my life, but it wasn't, it was a huge void, right? Huge void. It wasn't filling it at all, but I knew it had something. And so in any case, uh, he mentioned, what about, uh, like, I do not need to prove myself. Like, okay, that's not bad, but I don't like the negative in there. Let's see if we can get rid of that negative. So then um, after thinking about it for a couple of days um, and sitting with it, uh, I came up with, I am enough. And mm -hmm. so that is my affirmation. And so all energizers, right? If you've listened to me talk or anywhere, even the last past couple of podcasts, um, I don't always end with it, but I try to more and more intentionally now, I always end it, you are enough, right? You, just the way you are, you don't need to do anything, change anything or prove anything to anyone, not even yourself, you are enough. And um, that's where that stemmed from for me because I did not feel like I was for so long. And I feel that a lot of people struggle with that. So that's where that shift happened for me was when he brought my awareness to, I needed to prove myself. And then I came up with an affirmation. So that's how I started to fill that void, to fill that and change that narrative is going, I am enough. But like you, I then had to open myself up to the, the questions of going, is this choice that I'm making, am I making because I feel like I need to prove myself or is it aligned with who I am? And first I need to figure out who I am. What are my values? What are my beliefs? Where am I going? What's my vision? What are my priorities? All that. And that's why you know, we have a program uh, that helps people do that to discover their priorities, purpose and vision, all that stuff already. And we continue to help with that. So we gain that clarity, but um, it's because I, I needed to figure out for myself and we've worked other people through it, but now through there, then we go, okay, now I can base all those decisions all everything that comes my way through yeah. that lens and go, Hmm, does this align? Does it not align? If it aligns, great. Do I have time for it? Great. I say, yes. If I don't eh, no, then let's, let's move on and make sure that what I'm picking and choosing really benefits me. And then am I doing it? it goes through the filter now is, 
am I enough? Am I enough? Or do I need to prove myself? Is this, you know, like, am I having this conversation here to prove my worth or my value now? Like, no, this is benefiting myself, but also so many other people, right? It's, it's spreading it. So for me, it's that, starting that way. First, realizing it, being aware that, oh, I'm telling myself this narrative. What's the opposite of this narrative? What's the difference? How, how do I need to change it? And then asking yourself uh, or passing life through that filter small bits at a time and then growing that. Hey, sorry to butt in like this, but I have something really cool I want to share with you. Something that I know, I know it can help you live your life to the max. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a roadmap, a roadmap that gets you to your destination. What do roadmaps do, right? Well, you have your destination. It shows you how to get there, the best way to get to that point. And you know what? That's what I have. What is this roadmap I'm talking about? I'm talking about my book, Chase Your Passion. That's right. You have a passion. You have a destination. You have goals, dreams you want to achieve. But maybe you're confused on how to get there. Maybe you're feeling stuck. Well, my book, Chase Your Passions, is that roadmap. It guides you through how to create that plan, how to create that roadmap, how to get over hurdles so you can have success. So if you're ready to ditch the excuses, if you're ready to get unstuck and ready to have success, to taste success and feel amazing, to achieve your goals and dreams, get your copy of Chase Your Passions. It's available on Amazon or just head to my website, spencermjones.com. All right, let's catch y'all later and let's keep chasing our passions. Let's go. It's, it's so, so important, so good. And there's a couple things there that you said that stuck out to me. One, I'm going to start with two. Two is that there's a power of healthy community too. Mm. You're creating that for people. But when you're working on believing something new about yourself, it's hard because you have a muscle memory that has always gone down this path, right. which is you suck. You're worthless. You have no value. You're not enough. And so I, even, even just the other day, I was scrolling through some affirmations I have and I like, I can heart them, you know, the ones oh, that really nice. resonate. Yeah. It, and, um, but I found myself like, Oh, not that one. And hmm. it's an affirmation. I'm supposed to say it and believe it, but I found myself rejecting some of the affirmations, which was such a, like an eye opener for me too. Like, oh, I probably need to spend time with this one because it's not really like pick and choose the ones you've nailed. <laughs> it's like choose to believe positive things about you. And I found myself like approaching the affirmations like, oh yeah, that one seems true. Yeah, no, that one's not true. Like it's not about, I want to say it's not about it being true or not. Um, they are true. They are true. And it's about like getting into alignment with the belief. And I know that I experienced other people believing those things about me when I couldn't yet in healthy community, Yes, trusted, intentional community, not just anyone out in the world um, who could say, I see that in you. Yes. And there was like something where I could borrow their belief for a bit until I fully owned it myself. And I think that's some of the power of community is that when we come alongside and we're all on this journey and we can see and say what we see that's good in other people we get to help them also craft that new narrative and they can borrow I say it all the time you can borrow my belief if you need it I have plenty of belief to share that you are enough and if you're still on a journey of like owning that for yourself that's fine borrow mine I have full confidence that you're enough right. <laughs> um so that was like the second point that came up the first point is just the pattern of between us that it took a hurricane to, to open our eyes to that. And I hate that because I want to spare everyone else from life hurricanes that cause them to recognize something needs to change. And I need help, right? Like where it becomes a mental health issue. Same. My therapist said to me, Marcy, your survival skills expired. And I was like, Oh my gosh, you're right. They did. I, exp I, I, I took that as like, I expired. That was all I had were my survival skills and they just expired. Like, well now what? And that was also a time of like re not immediately like a sense of recreating, but it was definitely kind of a pause. It felt like in life to understand, well, if those don't work anymore because they expired, then what does work? And how did I end up here? Cause I never want to be here again, never. And I have a, have a hypervigilance now to ever being in the position where I'm not very functional because everything's expired. That was the cost for me was I just like slept for a year and I had young kids still. And I, you know, I had life to do. So I just was trying to, anyway, I just zombie, right? zombie was, because you're trying to work through. 
Yeah. And so I hear that pattern and I imagine that a lot of the people who come to you are there too, in some way, like it takes this kind of cataclysmic moment to recognize something's not working. And I would love if people would take their vitamins and not just go for the painkillers, like anyone who's here today, who hasn't had that, you are still telling yourself stories. And if you can do that work now, you'll never end up in a pit like Spencer and I ended up in. Um, it's so valuable. Like it, I, it is what opened my eyes and I'm grateful, but man, I wish I could have had that work before. And then I wouldn't have expired. I would have picked up a better story and lived from that story and have been healthy and, you know, all the things in between. So that's just an interesting point, you know, that it takes these hard moments to bring us to that awareness sometimes. It's yeah, I'm right there with you. Right. It's, it's sad that we have had to have those hurricanes, those big moments to take those catastrophic ones to blow us down and start from ground zero, uh, again. Um, and I, don't want that to happen to anyone else because it sucks. <laughs> However, let's be honest. Sometimes people do need it. I needed it. That I, I, I had people pointing it out to me left and right beforehand, and I did not notice their cue or take their cue because I blew it off. And for me, it was my ego saying, nah, you're good. You're better than that. Right. So yeah. I needed that. Now, yeah. again, I don't want anyone to go through that. I'm with you. Take your vitamins. Like, <laughs> your vitamins. Take, take my hand. I'll follow us. Follow um, what I'm sharing. Follow Marcy excuse me, Marcy, Marcy's sharing about um, your story, right? Change your story because you can, but you have to start to believe in it, right? And if you need to borrow other people's faith uh, faith and belief in you, that's huge. And that's one reason why we personally, and it sounds like I'm just promoting all our stuff, but it's not intentional, but like all of our Energizer family here is that big and that powerful because we want you to be surrounded by those people. You are are so much so the people that you surround yourself with. So if you surround yourself with negative people, you're probably going to be negative, right? People who are down. If you surround yourself with positive, uplifting people, they're going to help raise you up and you're going to be positive, uplifting and help other people. Be really intentional about who you surround yourself with. That's why we created this amazing community. That's why I'm part of our Energizer community, but also I'm part of the Unleash You family, right? And I have my men's mastermind group. I'm surrounding myself with people who raise me up, raise my vibration and help me be my best. So this leads into um, one of our last questions I have for you here, because I want to be respectful of your time, is, uh, okay, we've worked on ourselves, we've realized that we're telling ourselves these stories, we've changed that narrative, right, saying, okay, this is a story I'm telling myself, I need to change it, what's the reverse, what's the opposite of that, I'm passing it through uh, life through that filter now, now, how can we share that with others to empower other people in either in our circle, in our community or outside of that. Yeah. Do you mean share this, the new story that we're telling ourselves or just the idea of having new stories? Um, I would say sharing our new story because so many people yeah. believed us as uh, yeah. who we were before, right? Like, oh, the, that was the old Spencer or whatever. Uh, yeah. That was the old Marcy, but well, what about now? Oh, that's good. Yeah. I appreciate that too. Um, the first thought coming to mind, I'll say the how, but I'll say it with a, with a disclaimer and a caution first. And this goes back to healthy, trusted community. So don't be the sponge, put a nice little fence, not a wall, just a flexible fence that you can filter through the voices that speak truth to you and the ones that are just speaking, right? Um, when we change our stories, it's really uncomfortable for the people around us. A lot of them, really uncomfortable. And some of them will even tell you to be quiet or to go back to the way you were, or do something. They may not say those words, but they'll make suggestions. They'll give advice. They'll ask questions that can feel a little like jabs sometimes, or, or just the space that felt like a belonging space might feel less comfortable to you as well, because the atmosphere is resistant to the story that you're telling yourself that's new. That's, um, that's been a shock to me. That's why I want to say that. That's been a surprise to me a little bit because I am of the mind that like, let's all just do better and let's do better together and I'll help you right. do better and you help me do better and we'll make the world better. And not everyone's like that, I learned. <laughs> Some people are like, right. status quo, status quo. As long as I'm like thinner than you, I'm okay. Stop losing weight. You know, as long as I'm, you know, more successful than you are, I'm okay. So stop being successful. And and they there, there are people who are on their own journeys who are still telling themselves that they need you to be a certain way in order for them to feel something. And that's not your story to own. But just there's a disclaimer of mindfulness around that. And there will be people who 
will champion you and they might surprise you who they are, but they can be welcomed into the fence, right? Not the champions of like, yes, I see your worth and value. I love this new story. It's so good. I'm going to reinforce that in your life, like that kind of thing. Um, the way, well, the way that I've personally shared it is by sharing my personal story. And for people who've known me, um, well, known any of us, there's a history there. Uh, you and I both have some public platforms. So there's, there's also like intimate acquaintances and then people who are a little bit like, or maybe intimate friends and then acquaintances and then like the public and everyone feels a bit of responsibility to your story and a right to it. So, <laughs> so I've learned how to have a boundary around that. Like they don't have a right, but what can I share? That's a benefit. What can I, going back to the very beginning, what are the things that I'm learning that, man, I wish I'd known or had, and how can I put that into the world and really be aware of who I'm wanting to talk to so I want to talk to the woman who's still in an abusive relationship, who thinks that's where her worth and value comes from, who's stuck, who's whatever, whatever. I want her to know I see her and I, that she has worth and value, that she is capable of whatever she needs to do for her health and safety, that she's not crazy in this relationship that's gaslit and ghosty and all the things, right? Like I, so other people might try to respond to my story when I'm talking to her. But if I just remain mindful of who I'm talking to, then it does, they don't matter, right? I mean, they matter, but they don't matter. Um, I want to also give an example of a story. You, kind of, you gave yours, like, I have to prove my worth to I am enough. One for me, that a message that I had that I didn't know is that um, if, a, if a relationship broke or was strained or someone was able to leave a friendship with me, it's because I wasn't worth fighting for. I wasn't worth fighting to maintain the friendship, right? So in this situation with my husband and leaving that marriage in that space, I noticed a new story. I didn't even sit down and intentionally write it, but because of the self-awareness work I was doing, it formed. And the new story was, I'm worth it, but he's not capable of fighting for very worthy things. And I now, now, now I heard that story and now I take it places with me, right? Like, when someone is disgruntled or someone, whatever, if someone else is just on their own journey and they can't show up to our friendship in a way that's healthy for us, or they want to blame it on me, I'm just like, you know, it's not because I'm not worth it. It's because you're struggling to fight for worthy things. So cheers to you as you work on that. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm going to maintain my sense of value in this. Um, so I wanted to give an, another example of stories because people might be thinking like, what does that even mean? How do I change the story. It's looking at, do you feel like you're not enough? Do you feel like you have to achieve or be successful in order to experience love? Do you feel unlovable? Why? You know, do you feel like you're never going to be someone who has money? That was one I carried growing up in welfare, like, oh, money's for other people. Right. So then I lived that way. <laughs> um, and why, why do I feel that way? And then coming back and saying, no, I'm capable of making money who are the other people? I'm the other people. You know? And just kind of rephrasing that story. So I think you and I both have a wiring as well to have awareness around our own, our own emotional experience. And then to be able to imagine other people feeling the same way. So that is one, one way. And I think just showing up bravely in the spaces that you've been planted in. You talked about this earlier. People have their own light and you have a heart to help them shine brighter. It doesn't mean you have to do it as a podcaster. It doesn't mean you have to do it as an author or a coach like I am. It might mean that you do this in your home with your family. What does it mean to shine your light more brightly there and be vulnerable and brave with the new story you're telling yourself in those spaces? I think that's my full answer. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I, I love it. And yeah, 100% be behind all that. Share your story and whatever means that's comfortable for you and share your life. Right. And whether that's with your family, whether that's being an entrepreneur, whether that's just doing it with your coworkers, it doesn't matter, but, but share your light. And, and really, if I could uh, summarize this whole conversation in, in, into a couple sentences, which would be a, a travesty in any case, but um, what, what I would say is, be you, be your authentic self, realize who your authentic self is, your real self, your raw self, and love that person for who you are. Realize that the stories you might have been told by your parents, your teachers, your friends, yourself may not be true. 
and that it's as it's as easy as realizing that and then flipping the script easy in that sense but then it takes work it's not easy to change that story it takes work after that but once you realize that then you could start taking the work right you have the awareness you start taking the steps do the work to change that narrative you're telling yourself this uh, narrative you tell the world about you and then how you show up in your life as that beautiful amazing light to the rest of the world that's so good. I'll add one little image for people if it's supportive. I think it is. It was to me that my coach gave me. And that is that we go through life sometimes thinking that everyone's holding up mirrors and we mm -hmm. see our reflection in their mirrors. And it could be just in the way they treat us or the things they actually say or the way that, whatever. And I know I did. I, I saw myself and then I thought, well, I want to be prettier than that. I want to look better than that. I want to, I want to, and I was constantly trying to change the image in their mirrors. And he said one day, Marcy, that's not a mirror. That's a window. Like that's a window. They're holding up a window for you to look through into their own life experience. And it, and it, it just like reframed every conversation I have that when information comes at me, I can think, Oh yeah, you're holding, you've opened up your window. I can see through the shades now and, and, and your yard needs some mowing <laughs> and that's not my responsibility. Like if you're happy to live with what I see over there, that's cheers, but I don't, that's not about me. And it just now has given me language and an actual visual as I go through life. And I have certain conversations where I can step back and go, oh man, this is really trying to, to be a mirror. Or this person is really trying to say that it is my reflection or I'm tempted to see my reflection in the glass of the, the window, right. but it's not. And it's given me so much emotional disconnection at times from whatever's happening and space to, again, like you said, show up more authentically and truthfully and not be pushed and pulled based on what I'm seeing, but instead just to have a really solid stance on what is me and what is them? How do I be my best me and encourage them to be their, their best them, but it's not my responsibility. Right. And that was something hard for me. I, I made it my responsibility. It's not, there's some disconnection there. So just wanted to send that off in case that helps people going through your day, your energizers to go like, you know, if anything else today, look for those mirrors in those windows and make sure you're labeling them correctly, that you're actually looking at a mirror or you're actually looking at a window and then, and then respond to that way appropriately. I love that visual, something different. Cause we always, uh, at least for me, I see a lot, you know, everyone's a mirror, but I like that. Not all of them are mirrors. Some of them are windows and that's, that's sure. a beautiful thing. And, um, Wow, this has been such an amazing conversation. I'm so grateful to have you here, even with my stumble and stumbling and fumbling at the beginning and all that good stuff here at the end, I'm stumbling and fumbling too. It doesn't matter, <laughs> that's just me. And I accept that because I'm freaking awesome and that, that's okay. Yes. And you are freaking awesome and you are and you are and you get a car and you get a car. Oh, wait, I don't have cars to give away, but I could pass out lights. Here's your light, here's your light, here's light. Have fun with that. And Marcy, oh my gosh, this has been so much fun. Um, you are amazing. You are a light, a powerhouse in your own right. And how, how can energizers connect with you to work with you and have you help them with their narratives? Yeah, I love that. So I am a tra trauma certified story coach. I help people tell their story. So someone who's going like, man, I feel really called to put a message or my message into the world in some way, then that's what I help people do. And we talked about this earlier too. I had this, my own vision for myself of being called to not only shine as a lighthouse where I've been planted, but to help other lighthouses just shine brighter where they've been planted. And so that is my purpose and call when I work with clients is, okay, what is between you and getting your story into the world? Sometimes it's therapeutic stuff. Sometimes it's a need to wrestle with the story and to address the tiger. So we do that. Sometimes it's just discipline or mindset or whatever it is. So the whole process of the healing that happens uh, to get that story ready for the world. And then there's a whole other level of healing that happens once it's out there. So I work with speakers and writers. And then apart from that, I have a press where whatever the publishing needs are, I help. So consultation done for yous. So if someone's like, I did it, now what? Will you just do it for me? Like, yes, I will publish your book for you. Um, so that's it. I just do anything to help people get their stories into the world. And I bring in all that therapeutic and trauma awareness um, because that's why a lot of people quit. A lot of people quit because they don't know why they think they have writer's block. And it's like, 
that's a whole host of other things <laughs> that I know about and I help people overcome. So that you can go to marcypusey.com. Um, I've got some free guides that are available there as well. You can listen to the TEDx talks, reach out to me. I also do free strategy calls, marcypusey.com slash strategy. You can have a 15 minute call with me just to figure out what is my next step? I feel something. I want to do something with my story. What do I do? I'm happy to talk with you and help you figure out next steps and see if there's a way that I can support you. So that's what I do. I love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, energizers, go check her out, hit her up, let her help you share your story and create that. If that resonates with you, check it out. You can go to her website or you can always, uh, if you don't remember just go to spencermjones.com slash Jones and four show. And we'll have the show notes there for you and all that. So uh, Marcy, holy crap. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you as well. I, I, um, I know that a podcaster's audience is a very sacred space and I always feel the honor and trust given to me to be able to speak to them. So thank you for allowing me into that sacred space and trusting me with your people. And I'm here to cheer you on energizers and Spencer, like just thanks for this platform. You're doing an incredible, an incredible work. So thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. Know that we are here supporting you as well. So reach out if there's anything we can do. Likewise. So thank you. Energizers, you have an amazing day, right? So enjoy, embrace the amazingness of the day. If you can do me a favor and just hit subscribe or follow so you don't miss a single episode. Uh, and, you know, you got to remember, you are freaking enough just the way you are, right? I said it earlier. You don't have to do anything, change anything or prove anything because you are freaking awesome. So until next time, I'll catch you later.